These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is Cephalocide, written by Alex Wakeford and narrated by Justin Fife. Did you know that human life came from the sea? Clouds of dust and gas collapsed to create the solar system. Cosmic forces formed the cauldron of ingredients that would compress particles. Heated by supernova, violent collisions with asteroids, and comets cooling over countless millennia. Hydrogen and oxygen mixing to bring forth the fluid of life. Water. Within single-celled organisms sprang into being, gaining complexity over billions of years as they became multicellular, filling the vast oceans of the planet Earth with an abundance of life. That's where we began, 540 million years ago. Our common ancestor known as Saccharitis coronarius. If you were to look into a mirror back then, you would see what almost looks like a human head with no eyes or nose, just a broad mouth layered with multiple rows of rounded teeth and a series of conical ridges ringing the head-like crown. You would be looking at the very first stages of evolution before life crawled its way out of the ocean and through the mud. It is with some poetic irony that we look now at the state of our planet and find ourselves returning to our ancestral home after losing our ability to survive and thrive within it. Anderson fumbled with the strap on his diving mask, cursing through gritted teeth as he attempted to fit it onto his head. He didn't know how Marin had managed to screw it up, but he always did. It would either be left too loose or squeezed so tight he feared the pressure might shatter the lens into his eyes. He was only half listening to the program on a battered old television that had been ungraciously duct taped to an open cabinet to prevent it from falling out as the boat cantered over the water like an undisciplined horse. The documentary came to an end, and after the credits, a newscaster appeared. His face scrunched as a torrential storm was blown the direction he was facing, standing atop what remained of the San Francisco seawall. After the ice caps had melted in 2053, it had not only caused the sea level to rise across the planet, but had unleashed a myriad of primordial bacteria that, in addition to the increased density of salt water, ravaged farmland and coastal forests, turning once fertile land into deadly marshes or salt flats. Where cities became the last redoubt for human settlement, coastal refugees lining the streets with nothing but the clothes on their back, disease and famine quickly followed, worsened by storms causing more flooding than the underfunded and archaic drainage infrastructure could handle. Weathering a storm was one thing, but living the reality in the sum total of decades to failure to address a century-old issue was quite another. And so, it was through gritted teeth that Anderson endured whatever comparatively minor inconvenience Marin threw at him, intentional or otherwise. The salvage life was far from glamorous and even further from respectable, but there wasn't a single thing about being a city dweller he missed. The view on deck above only further consolidated that feeling. Towers and apartment blocks remained standing in the middle of the sea like headstones for a mass grave, with houses gardens, statues, shops, and even schools, all lost to the deep. The three divers, himself, Marin, and Varl, methodically checked their gear as they waited for the clock to strike eleven and sink their heads up displays to track each of their vitals. Fortune had favored them as gray clouds parted and the light from the sun shone through. 
penetrating the water to allow for better visibility. Scanners could map routes and camera drones could scout areas of interest, but the captain, himself a grizzled caricature of an old world seafarer, insisted that it was a sailor's eye that would see the glint of real treasure. That, he claimed, was how he knew to find what had allegedly been an affluent neighborhood around Long Beach in Los Angeles. Tragic as the loss of whole towns and cities was, for Anderson, there was a kind of beauty to the oceanic world that opened up before him as the divers plunged into the water and got what had been previously been described as a bird's eye view. Distant highways covered in multicolored marine flora, clusters of purple coral, brushes of red sea wisps, forests of kelp. They look like veins connecting across the body of a vast ecosystem. Their target was perhaps the most ostentatious of their recent run of salvage operations. As they swam closer, Anderson imagined how it must have looked in its prime. A side-turned monolithic slab, its featureless, off-white exterior providing a faux brutalist facade that would no doubt contrast the extravagance within. Light that shone on the 200-foot pool would reflect on the underside of the equally long house, the perfect place to spend the day before gathering around the circular sunken fire pit, complete with built-in sofa seating and compartments for stores of wine. Entry was easy enough, as this abode had been lost long before the rich had begun turning their homes into fortresses. Swimming up the spiral staircase from the underside, the three divers emerged into a corridor that ran the length of the house, lined with sturdy hardwood flooring, which turned off into the various rooms like a train carriage. Perhaps the most peculiar feature of this corridor was the extensive aquarium, a concave glass display spanning the length of the back of the wall that was full of octopuses in all different kinds, a blue-gray seven-armed octopus, a California two-spot, several venomous blue rings and others Anderson had never seen before. If there had been other sea life within the aquarium, they had no doubt been consumed by these starving cephalopods. Some had evidently resorted to cannibalizing their smaller pygmy brethren as half a dozen partially consumed corpses had sunk into the floor. It seemed needlessly cruel to have this aquarium in the first place, let alone keeping them locked in here now that the house itself was fully underwater. Anderson stared into the eyes of the largest, the giant Pacific octopus, noting the impulse to anthropomorphize creatures in nature by applying human emotions to them. But these creatures were intelligent. There was surely some recognition of the story lot in life they had found themselves in, the world just beyond the glass that, he supposed, belonged to them once more. Anderson signed to Marin and Val to find a way to open the aquarium. Marin nodded, seemingly having had the same thoughts, and began searching for a release hatch. Varl, however, paused for a moment, his gaze directed at something Anderson couldn't see. He drifted over and tapped him on the shoulder, signing a question. Varl just pointed over to the corner of the room, where two small figures looked as if they were suspended from the ceiling like puppets on strings. Two children, a boy and a girl. Couldn't have been older than ten. No sign of their parents' bodies yet. Had they gone out? Had they abandoned them? It seemed neither Anderson nor Varl could hold back intrusive images of them trying to escape as the water rushed in. No way out as they... Wait... Eyeing a small hardwood staircase that led to the bedroom quarters, Anderson noticed that the angle seemed slightly off, as if there was something beneath holding it up. While he'd only been involved in a few raids of the sunken houses of the rich, they'd all had one thing in common. Panic room, he signed to Varl, who helped him plant his flippers on the ground and strained to raise the staircase like the heavy lid of a treasure chest as its coral-crusted mechanisms turned. Directing Varl to go back and check on Marin, Anderson grabbed the handrail and pulled himself inside the entrance to the panic room. Whatever malfunction had occurred meant that whoever had taken refuge inside hadn't lasted very long as the house became submerged. Quite right, too, Anderson thought, his mind feeling once more with the ugly possibilities as the image of the two children drowning helplessly arose. The lights weren't working. 
prompting Anderson to fiddle with his shoulder-mounted torch as he pushed forward into the inky darkness and felt himself bump into something soft. Finding the catch to switch his light on, Anderson almost jumped out of his skin at the sight of what was before him. The body of a man who had clearly suffered the same fate as the children he'd abandoned in attempting to save his own skin. But, oh God, Anderson felt his heart pump faster in his ears. What the hell is that on his face? The potent mixture of fear and curiosity drove Anderson to adjust his light to illuminate the man's face, which he realized wasn't his face at all. The octopus had attached itself to his head and camouflaged its skin texture to the color to match what? Its victim? That would be absurd, but he could see it. The chitinous beak was open. The circumference of its mouth had dilated to a size that was large enough to cover the man's head above his chin, and its eyes were closed. Anderson had studied how the octopuses killed their prey. Once it had captured the meal in its arms, both its beak and drill-like tongue would break through the exterior shell and venomous saliva would be injected into the wound to either paralyze or kill it. He dared himself to get closer, peering at the octopus's tentacles that had wrapped around the man's neck and gripped his exposed upper body so tightly that the skin had blistered and swollen. Within the pressurized breakages across his flesh, Anderson could see what looked like clusters of thick gray barnacles pushing out like hair growing from follicles beneath the surface. It was as if the octopus was some kind of parasite that had latched onto its host and causing some horrifying transformation. Among the questions racing through his mind, he knew the answer for how the creature had gotten into the panic room. Octopuses have boneless bodies and are able to squeeze through even the most unlikely of tiny cracks. And if the malfunctioned door to the panic room had seemed obvious to him, then an octopus would have had no issue slipping inside. At that moment, the display inside Anderson's visor showed Marin and Val's heart rate suddenly spike before hitting the red zone. Either their oxygen tanks had somehow been compromised or... Anderson propelled himself backwards, finding the handrail along the side of the wall and put one hand in front of the other as fast as he could. Emerging into the main area of the house, he scanned from left to right and saw... nothing. He'd expected to see Marin and Val thrashing about, trying to reattach their gear, but there was no sign of them. Moving into the tube-like hallway, Anderson's blood ran cold as he saw they had successfully opened the aquarium's release hatch. Its occupants, the surviving octopuses, were gone. Slowing his breathing, Anderson drifted slowly down the hallway, determined now just to get back to the ship. Being a city dweller suddenly didn't seem like such a bad idea compared to whatever the hell he'd just witnessed. Maybe he'd read a book about it. He comforted himself with the thought of the day's events making successful publication and netting him a small fortune. It was all he could focus in his mind as the water around him became hazy and dark once more, inky clouds obscuring his vision. A sudden impact to Anderson's shoulder caused him to flail and grab at the exposed gash in his wetsuit. He felt hands, human hands, searching across his body for shit. The carbon fiber tube connecting the mast to his scuba tank was severed. If he didn't break for it now, he was going to die. As he thrashed around, attempting to fight off the grip that had worked its way to his neck, the ink cloud cleared. He saw it was Marin's hand closing on his throat. Beside him was Varl and the two children, all of them with octopuses over their heads. Anderson's time was up. He could hold his breath and fight no longer as he choked in fear. Water entered his oxygen-starved body and began to fill his lungs. The last thing he saw was another octopus, the Great Pacific from the tank, making its way over to him. Its tentacles gripped around his head as it opened its beak, its mouth expanding as it lowered itself over his face. And as drilling into his skull quickly faded to dull nothingness as it paralyzed him, it did not speak with words but simply vibrated parts of the brain to convey understanding of its message. Did you know that human life came from the sea? The cephalopod formed an image in his mind of that fate that had awaited them all. 
a human head devoid of features beyond a large, multi-layered mouth and a crown of conical ridges. Welcome back to the deep. Welcome home. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. Cephalicide was written by Alex Wakeford, narrated by Justin Fife, edited by Duncan Muggleton with music by Kai Engel and Tom Robson, and sound effect provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Carolyn O'Brien for helping with our submission reading. And of course to Ben Errington for those content-free pointers he scores from the social media basketball court. He's also, weirdly, on his way to my house right now. To kill me. You can follow Alex Wakeford on Twitter at www.twitter.com forward slash haruspis. That's H-A-R-U-S-P-I-S. Justin Fife is a voice actor and podcaster. You can follow him on Twitter at www.twitter.com forward slash Justin B. Fife. The Other Stories is a production of the story studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means, share the hell out of it. So, until next time.